Good morning, people in the UK and Europe and Africa. Good afternoon, uh, people from Asia. I'm Tan Sui Che, the immediate past president of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries. Welcome to this special edition of the IFOA Thought Leadership Program. At the last count, there were 230 people tuning into today's webinar. I would like to extend a warm welcome to you all. In this session, we'll be having a conversation with Dr. Patrick San Chong Hoon, the chief sponsor of the IFOA Thought Leadership Program 2021, about his career, his views on the actual profession, and his philanthropic work amongst other issues. I'm also joined today by my co-host, Katina Tahe Thompson, an IFOA council member and the chair of the, I of the IFOA Foundation. Before I embark on the discussion, I want to provide some context for the inaugural IFOA Thought Leadership Program. In my presidential address a year ago, I said one of my priorities was to revive the spirit of a learned society and bring thought leadership to the foreground at the IFOA. The COVID-19 pandemic and its effect in pushing all our engagement sessions and conversations online helped create the catalyst for wider debate and also made it physically and technically easier to reach speakers and audiences all around the world. We seek to reposition the IFOA at the center of key societal debates and move the conversation forward whilst engaging and inspiring our membership and our audiences. We hope to increase the IFOA's reputation in, or, in order to grow awareness of the contribution actuaries can make to the world's biggest problems today. And to illustrate how we execute our public interest duties. Both these aims reflect the IFOA's BSMD or vision, skills, mindsets and domain strategy, and its vision for actuaries to deploy their skills, expertise, and influence in new and wider areas. We commenced the Thought Leadership Program in January this year, comprising a number of events throughout the first half of this year, and all the topics have a link to the IFOA strategy, and they are grouped into four broad categories. Firstly, the presidential speaker series chaired by members of the IFOA presidential team, and this series convenes experts in fields connected with the work of actuaries and the sectors they work in with the IFOA's community to provide stimulating debate and thought leadership on the important issues of our time. Today's event is part of the series. And the second one is the finance in public interest. Over the course of eight days in March 2021, the finance in a public interest series brought together leading thought leaders, John Kay, Sir Paul Collier and Andy Hordain, and created a thought-provoking and at times controversial debate looking at policy, regulatory and social economic factors affecting the financial and regulatory system. As part of this series, a panel of senior and experienced actuaries, including Ashok Gupta, Nick Silva, Lucy Say, and Nico Espinel, also discussed the implications of these issues for today's and tomorrow's actuary. In April, May, we ran a two-week series on actual innovation in the COVID-19 era. We showcased the range of ways the actual profession has rose to the occasion to deliver our public interest. The program included speakers from the IFOA's COVID Action Task Force, the ICAT, the COVID-19 Actuaries Response Group, the, continuity, the Continuous Mortality Investigation, as well as external speakers from government and academia. Behavioral Science Series. Finally, between May and July, they are running a diverse range of events looking at ideas and concepts or experiences which all share some common aspects of behavioral science, which we think are relevant to actuaries. Topics range from the wicked problems to the growth mindset to leading transformational change. And this series will conclude next month on July the 16th with a panel of past presidents discussing the implications and challenges raised throughout the series for actuaries. We do not expect the IFOA's thought leadership program to end here. 
Planning is already underway for sustainability series linked to the upcoming COP26 meeting, as well as revisiting themes like the finance in the public interest and the growth mindset in growth in more debt. So what does this have to do with Dr. Pratik Poon? The IFO leadership program has only been possible thanks to its generous sponsorship granted in the program's early stages. This enabled us to expand more resources in developing the program and create a full, frequent, and varied set of content, attracting actuaries and non-actuaries to our debate. Apart from this, he is also the chief philanthropist of the £500,000 IFOA Foundation China and Southeast Asia Fund, a bursary fund set up to support deserving actual students in 14 universities and thought leadership in the Asian region. This seems to be a good moment for me to introduce our guest more formally. Dr. Patrick Poon is the chairman of Xinchong Charitable Foundation Limited and Harvest SCP Group Company Limited, his family owned investment enter enterprise. He was treasurer, council, and court member at the Hong Kong Politics, Polytechnic University and chairman of the Hong Kong Polytechnic University Foundation. Uh, Nikki, I think it's the other slide you want to show first. Uh, he is now a council member of the University of Hong Kong and is the deputy chairman of Foundation of Educational Development and Research and chairman of Hong Kong University Convocation. Dr. Poon is a well-known philanthropist with donations, mainly in the area of supporting tertiary education and community service. He has an extensive list of honors and awards reflecting his impressive giving back to society, education, and the actual profession. And one of his most notable ones is the Silver Bauhinia Star, SBS Award, awarded by the Hong Kong government in 2018 for Patrick's community service philanthropy, especially to the higher education. Now a bit of background on his career. In 1975, he became the first Hong Kong-born citizen to obtain the professional qualification of the fellow of the Institute of Actuaries in the UK. Later, he also obtained the fellowships of actuaries in Australia, China, Taiwan, and the USA. He was past president of the Hong Kong Actuarial Society, as well as the Actuarial Society of Malaysia. And during his 40 years career, with the life insurance industry, he has served as general manager and CEO or chairman at many international insurance companies such as AIA, Aetna, ING Insurance, ING Anti Life Insurance, and China Pacific Life Insurance Company. Today, Patrick spends his time chairing a family investment company, Harvest SCP Group Company Limited, golfing, playing mahjong, enjoying good food, and solving maths puzzle. He's also an owner of a media company called Master Insight. Before I move to the discussion mode, I would like to inform you that you can, summon, you can submit a question at any time via the online Q&A function on Zoom. And I would really encourage all of you to do so. With this, I would like to ask Patrick and Katina to join us in a discussion. And I would probably like to ask Katina to start the ball rolling and give me a chance to catch my breath. Thank you, Suche. That's us. That's great. And um, thank you, Dr. Poon, for, for joining us today. Uh, I'm, I'm really interested in your life story and, and kind of general reflection in terms of, um, you know, what you've gone through. Um, I've heard um, your speech at the uh, new qualifiers um, ceremony a couple of weeks ago, and, and it's really fascinating. Um, so can we start with uh, what made you decide to be an actuary? Um, and, and also knowing the things that you know now, what would you say to your younger self at the start of your career? Actually, um, I make my decision without much, much really study or analysis about the profession. Um, in secondary school, I liked uh, chemistry and maths. And eventually I got into the Hong Kong University studying both of them. But actually, um, my most my interest is really chemistry, uh, not maths, uh, and also my probably abilities is more on the arts subjects rather than scientific subjects. 
So my secondary school subjects, actually all my history, geography, languages, are actually have better scores uh, than my scientific subjects. I particularly hate uh, physics and biology. So I can never be a, be a scientist or, <coughs> or, a, or a doctor. But of course, now I'm a doctor, not, not a medical science. Um, but one teacher in secondary school uh, inspired me, or not, he really didn't do it deliberately, but he told the class, if you study mathematics, uh, graduate, then the uh, high, highest income is to become a natural. During those, uh, nobody knows about what the profession is like. There's no, actually nobody in Hong Kong qualified. And actually practically uh, during my time, one or two actuaries only worked in, uh, in Hong Kong at the time. <clears throat> Most companies use consultant actuaries overseas. So I didn't even know what is, what is this profession like? Uh, is it an accountant? Uh, is it something queer? We don't know. Uh, so after graduation, uh, I, of course, uh, well, remember my teacher's uh, saying, so I applied a job with AIA. And, and also at the same time, I applied a job with the civil service. And the uh, salaries are very different. Okay. Uh, the civil service pays very well, have very secure uh, career track. And I came from a poor family. If I don't have a, have a common uh, assistance, I, I cannot enter universities at all. So my family, my parents are not educated at all. So they, they actually persuaded me to, uh, to go to government. Uh, because I couldn't make a good decision. I know to uh, enter AIA, I may become a, I can study to, to be a professional. If I join the government, I become a bureaucrat, um, maybe a very secure, secure future and also very bright too. Actually, in a way, if I had joined the government, I probably uh, uh, would be much more famous. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe uh, I got sanctioned from USA. <laughs> but um, so I joined the government because I let my parents uh, make the decision. My parents definitely need me to help at home yeah. financially. Uh, they have actually waited too long for me to begin work and uh, earn income for the family. So what they did is, well, let's make the decision through uh, the temples. So my mother went to the temple and asked the God to make a decision. Yeah. And obviously I know the decision must be the government because <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't go myself. <laughs> I didn't know really the answers. So, so after two years in government, I know that my, I won't become a professional at all. And, and I would like to see whether the mess I learned in, the, in, the, in my university can be applied and see whether I can become a professional. I saw some of my schoolmates entering the accounting professions and they are they're starting to have a good, Good sort of path. Uh, so I thought, hey, well, let me try. But AIA, of course, uh, is willing to, uh, to uh, accept me again. They, they were quite good uh, because my math uh, score was very good in, in, in university. So they thought I had a good potential to become a actuary. So they offered me again the actual training position at the same salary two years ago. So I suffer about 40% salary cut when I joined AIA. That was a high risk uh, decision. Uh, and I also uh, got married at the same time. And uh, being a Chinese, um, I would say Chinese man, I refused to let my wife work after marriage. I said, if I cannot, I cannot fit you. I deserve, I do not deserve to marry you. Uh, and she agreed. But she give me one condition. We should not live with my parents. Uh, this is a very, very difficult decision for Chinese family. But I understand that uh, 
So I agree. So we uh, started together, two of us, rent a very small room, and then I work uh, as an American. Well, so my 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 decision is basically to seek to become a professional. I don't even know what I actually like. And the first thing in my in my work, I'm not even asked to do mathematical work. I'm asked to design a, a, a tool to help agents uh, to look at premiums, premium, ta uh, premium table for agents. So they're going to have a designer rather than <laughs> actually, because they know I have not passed any exams. But uh, that, but eventually I thought my decision was very good because um, it really uh, put me into hard work and I learned a lot, which I don't think I can learn from the government. Yeah. On the other hand, the two days uh, when I worked in government, I did accumulate good experience too. Uh, at least my English was very good, uh, become better. I can uh, write uh, good, good papers. Yeah which is different from the other peers in the actuarial training group. Because most actuarial trainees are mess oriented. Yes. Good in figures, but not good in writing. So yeah. I sort of uh, have my writing skills uh, better than my peers at the time. That, that's so, so, the, sorry, CJ, go on. I, I think most of our young actuaries are probably better than me in making the uh, more rational decision because they all, they all would have much more information than me the decision was made. Yeah, and, and your, your path is, um, you know, as, as you, you mentioned, it's, it's not very typical because you started with the government and then, um, and then you moved to, to private sector. So is there anything, uh, any lesson learned um, that you would say to your younger self um, to, to you know, what, what you've learned now um, so, so that your younger self will be more informed? Yeah, I, I probably uh, I was um, a little bit frustrated after two years in government. I know my path, I, I, I look at the uh, career path of my fellow officers and uh, they're not much challenge in your work. You are trained to uh, to sort of look at the regulations and that just just proceed according to the regulations. Um, and then the interesting thing is that I think I became too secure because after two years, if I, con I got confirmed in the government employment, I need six months notice before I can leave government, which means that I can never leave government because I don't have the money. No, no employer will wait for you for six months. <laughs> so, so I said that I better go now with one month's notice and join a, a new, and uh, let me try another path and so on. But I know I'm starting two years behind everybody. So I work extra hard for also uh, to, to catch, catch up, so to speak. And also I have uh, a wife to support. And, and the good thing so about that, yeah. The good thing so about very, <laughs> thing about AIA is that they give you a salary increase if you pass one subject. Yes. Salary increase is very good. It's better than bonus. Uh, you <laughs> look at it. So I try very hard to pass the exams. So I didn't really uh, look at really what is actually, I, at that time I focused on getting the exams through. Yeah. And, and with your experience with exams, is there any advice you would give to students? Um, currently yeah, the advice is definitely, because most people when they are taking the exams, they do it together with an employment. So they have to work during the day too for an employer, for example, in an insurance company or in an investment company or consultant company. So the work requirement is also there during the day. So do you have much time to, uh, to study? Uh, enough time to study? There's always the uh, issue. 
And during my time, there were no examination leave. And no sort of study leave yep. uh, at those days. Um, so I'm a new employee. I don't actually, even, even during my marriage, I've only given a very special three days off because I'm only a new employee. So, uh, so you have to time manage well to allow more time to study. Uh, I remember during those days, I uh, worked from nine to five, mm -hmm. go back home, sleep a while, wake up at about seven, eight, or eight p.m. and study till 3 a.m. and then sleep again. So this is Monday to Friday. That was my routine during those two or three years. Um, so in order to actually have enough uh, study time. Uh, I practically do not socialize. I didn't look at the TV. Yep. I only have one day completely free, Sunday for my wife. Uh, that's the day we go to cinemas. But when my, my wife said that was the best time of our life because she sure had one day for me <laughs> and me for her. <laughs> and eventually, when I when I progress in my career, I'm so busy that we don't even have an alloc allocated time. But this yeah. is a very good experience. But yeah. I focus on yeah. uh, time management. I think you have to prepare very well for the exams. I remember practically every material I read at least three times, sometimes five times. Mm -hmm. Because the more time I read it, the more I get on the inside from what is in the course, what's in theory. Especially the institute exams. Institute exams are very little compared to other, for example, the society exams, very little written material. The two tests, of course, we have the tuition uh, service where I need uh, the homework and so on. But uh, very little, very little reading. But when you read more and more, you understand that these English people, when they write a sentence, they have a lot of meaning inside it. <laughs> and yeah, you have yeah. to read three to five times before you understand. I remember one page in uh, one textbook. I couldn't understand it after reading five times. Suddenly I realized that it is written after some mathematical derivatives. I started to try to derive myself and find that it's five pages of mathematics. The conclusion is written in English. Seems to be not mathematical, but actually is so so deep. So I, I think I, I I I can understand that. So I spent a lot of time besides studying the material. I also studied exam questions in the past exam questions. Yeah. I think most people who are experts in exam passing know this technique <laughs> to uh, to understand to try to guess what the examiner would. <laughs> Yeah. Ooh, and so, on. so actually, um, technically, I know in my final exams for life insurance, I probably can guess this year they will probably ask this question. That's my, yeah. Quite well prepared. <laughs> uh, Patrick, there's uh, some there's, uh, Patrick, if you don't mind me, uh, sort of being slightly because uh, uh, we want to have a wide range of discussion, and I okay. I thought um. Your, your remarks just now with uh, Katina on, on the security of uh, government jobs, right? Uh, and coming yeah. out uh, to work with the research, which is quite an interesting space to explore uh, for our members, right? Uh, because you have a business career, you, you have a corporate leadership career and eventually more business, yeah? Uh, yeah. But many of our actuaries are also fairly technical. So I, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, you, 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 you decided to leave government to, to join AIA and then you had a very successful career. What is your advice to, to actuaries today uh, and the kind of qualities we should reflect on? This is uh, yes. particularly uh, pertinent in today's debate, right? Because uh, a debate as in uh, the last 12, 18 months about, uh, there, are, there are certain qualities associated with an actuary which is more about cautiousness and being accurate. And that links to a previous interview you gave and you say that work is not work unless you make a decision. Can you speak into that space uh, about, yeah. uh, okay. about different types of work and leadership in business? Uh? When you talk about cautious, cautiousness, 
Well, we thought that actuaries are very careful, but I of course met a lot of not careful actuaries too. <laughs> but actually, because because we deal with long term problems usually, that's why people thought that we would be conservative. We should not. We we will look at the long term. We don't pay much regard to uh, certain changes and things like that. So it seems that uh, we thought that actuaries are too careful. But of course, we have always the training that if we make a mistake, we always make it on the conservative side so that we always survive. <laughs> survive is the most important of all uh, technique we always have. Uh, but I would think that uh, also one of the, one of the, one of the uh, skills we always taught was we reason from experience. Now, experience is always past. So people thought always something that we are out of date. But actually our work is to predict the future. So we, we, we always should be more uh, in a way that, uh, more I would say, uh, we should read right away. We should know information, get a lot of information more about others in order to be able to predict future better rather than just re rely on the past. More sensitive about any sort of changes too. It doesn't mean that we will change some of our calculations or what, but it would actually help us to, to make our assumptions before we make our predictions. Because in any predictions, any work we do is based on practically a lot of, because our hallmark is, is we present our results always more on a quantitative way, a very quantitative type of profession. And, uh, and we, we sort of forget that these numbers are derived from a set of assumptions. And we remember to be very careful about the assumptions. When we communicated, when we committed our results with other people, we should be very conscious of this. So I would think that uh, for young people or anyone, um, getting more experience is very important. So um, now, of course, it's better than uh, those days. Nowadays, uh, information is not so much so so easily share uh, uh, with us. Uh, very difficult for us to get data or even information and so on. Now we have too much information sometimes. Mm. Then our work now is how to filter this information, how to filter this data. Uh, some of them can be used, some of them should not be used, some can be used better, uh, more and some less and so on. But during those days we have a lot of work taking out data. So uh, the challenges are the same actually. Although we say we are simpler, we have more simple tools in the past, uh, but uh, of course uh, our, our sort of uh, standard of demand is different too. Now, now it's easier. You have more, more data, more speed in calculations. Then we have to produce more sort of focus, or you, you, you say accurate, but you know, I don't think it's accurate, it's just a more relevant results. Yeah. More to the point to make, uh, to make, uh, uh, because the world asks us to do that. <laughs> uh, would you encourage, um, the other day you were uh, making a difference between um, working as in work, and also making decisions, right? Uh, and, and you say making decision is the is the real work, yeah. Or you imply that. Uh, I wanted to ask you: um, uh, Would you encourage uh, some actuaries, and under what conditions, uh, for them to be more entrepreneurial? Yeah, more entrepreneurial. Can you speak to that space? Uh, there was a question from Peter Tompkins, uh, uh, one of our senior actuaries, and he and he also sort of asking that kind of questions, right? So so how do we uh, tackle this whole issue? 
to take calculated risk, lah, to take calculated <laughs> risk. Yeah. Well, we, we, we should know because we are experts in calculation of risk or, or examining uh, probabilities, right? Actually, I, I, I think any decision making is that you make a decision that, that is a higher probability of success is always there. And I think we are well trained for that. And when you say about more entrepreneurial, because I don't really know how, how to define the word entrepreneurial, I would say that you are applying your skill to some, some areas that's not traditional. Then you thought it's entrepreneurial, but not necessarily so. You just, I think uh, uh, another way to do things which may produce better results. I would say that. Now my whole 40 years is in life insurance. I create uh, new companies. I turn around uh, bankrupt companies. I work in uh, established companies. But every time I like to do things a different way. But yep. not necessarily entrepreneurial. But I, why I want to do things different way. I know one way to do the job already, but I want to try B instead of the A that was done yesterday. Because when you try B, you perhaps go into another, discover some new opportunities you never see when you go the usual route. Uh, in my management book, uh, which is uh, for, for, for young um, sort of executives or business people, uh, a cartoonist actually illustrate my lesson here. He, 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 he has a group of people walking along a very smooth path, but another person walking a tightrope over, over, over a very dangerous valley. Now, both may get to the same destination, but the safe, safer guy safely got, got there but he missed all the signals. He missed all the possible possibilities when the type group guy walked through. So that's when I would say that is entrepreneurial, but they may arrive at the same, same distance. Now, it depends. It, uh, for us actuarial uh, sort of jargon, I would say that the first route is safe, guaranteed result. The second route it's not safe, entrepreneurial, but it can give you a chance of much better. Because you may find that the destination is not good enough. <laughs> if you go this way, you can go to something even much higher, much better. And then you are ahead of the competition. But my philosophy is that, well, I'm not risky. I try this one. But if something goes wrong, I have I know my safe route. I can always go back and use the safe route. I won't put all my bags to go one way. That's my philosophy. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's very helpful, uh, 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 Patrick. Uh, there, there's a there, there's a two different groups of people in IFOA in the UK. Uh, you are, you're well known in Hong Kong, uh, but but we are also very curious uh, about your recent involvement with us. Um, one is on thought leadership and of course the foundation work, which is very significant. And I know that Katina is very curious about that. But firstly, on thought leadership, um, uh, I, I spoke to you uh, in, in February, I think, uh, soon after the Malaysian event, and you were very quick um, to support our program. I, I wanted to ask you, uh, what was your thinking? Uh, why do you think our program, uh, the one we are doing, uh, is important to us? And how do you think it's going on? And, and what should we do more of uh, in the future? Uh, and, and I thought leadership has two streams, uh, and we have emphasized more on the sustainability and some of the finance and COVID-19. But I also know that you, are, you yourself are very keen on uh, digital data science and, 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 uh, uh, and the fourth industrial revolution. Uh. So maybe about actually in a changing world, uh, could, could you give us some of your thoughts on this? It, 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 when, when I retire, I need to make a decision that, uh, well, I should, it actually is done before even I retire. So 
which was besides actually uh, doing my work, I also have the capacity to help particularly human beings to, to progress. Now, we, we cannot progress unless we have thought leadership all the time. We keep on thinking, we should, we should not be satisfied with what is, what, what is the past. Uh, not only to solve current problems, but how to actually build a better future for, for, for human beings. So that's why my donations, my work is always on uh, with the universities. Because in the universities, we have the best minds there. And I want to mix with them. So I, I really, uh, probably, practically every week, I have some thought leadership discussions with my, with my uh, colleagues or workers uh, together in the university. So, and I'm, I'm the chairman of the Hong Kong U Convocation and we organize forums uh, for discussion of university affairs, the future of the universities and so on. So I'm, I'm quite familiar with this uh, platform. So, but I, I did not actually aware, I was not aware too much about the uh, Institute of Faculties and way, but, but paying back to the profession is always my, my top of my mind too. So when you talk about this, I said, well, exactly, <laughs> this is something I should support. So not, 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 not necessarily to me to have a second, second thought about it. Really, I think it's something that we should support. We, we, we human beings must progress. We must need God leadership all the time. Yeah. And, whether, and whether, whether we are right or wrong, I don't care because it's only future can prove that we are right or wrong. But we have to do it. Okay. Yeah, and, and that, that's really interesting. And you link the thought leadership point with your, um, uh, you know, want to um, give back to the profession. Um, and I think that's a good segue into kind of your philanthropic um, activities. Um, and as you mentioned at the start, you know, you're, you're our chief philanthropist um, at the foundation and you do a lot with universities uh, in, in Hong Kong uh, around education and, and, and stuff. Um, so so you, you, you talk a bit about why it's important to you, but can you talk a bit more about, uh, about that and, and linking that to how you would encourage actuaries um, to give back um, to, to, to the profession um, and, and what you expect um, for yeah. to do. In I, I think probably basically I'm the receiving end of, uh, of support from others. Particularly during my school days, uh, we are from a poor family, so we always need uh, scholarships and so on. And I am particularly uh, very thankful to my mentors, to people who uh, helped me during the early part of my career. Even uh, my boss in government helped me a lot. Uh, as a matter of fact, after I left government, he left also a year later. He thought that, well, I, <laughs> there's a better way to go. <laughs> but anyway, uh, during my young days, during all my careers, every time I, I thought I was so lucky that I get people to help me. Uh, colleagues and other other people. Um, my, my, for example, my secondary school teacher and so on. So if the, our young generation have people like this to help them, then definitely we will produce more and more success uh, in the community. So now, when we have surplus, like finance or other thing, time, or, or a good network of uh, people and so on. And we, we have this capacity. If we don't lose them, we don't share with our others, yeah. it's not useful. It's just like your bank account. If you don't use the money, it's just numbers. If you use it to build something, somebody can use it and then we progress. So that's always my thinking. And uh, the best way of course is to for my personally saying thank you to, the, to my supporters and also allow people to use uh, resources. 
I always criticize my daughter who accumulated a lot of clothes and shoes at home. I said, well, if you don't use it for three months, don't need it to somehow put it to use it. <laughs> because that is very definitely and no way is to have the environment too. But, but that's my, my philosophy. Um, so, so far um, I started, of course, helping my, my own alma mater. My primary school, my secondary school, my university, and my profession. Like uh, so, I started a lot of uh, help to actual students and so on. Uh, now, I don't have any any sort of other reasons, but I find something really funny when I do something like this. Some of my friends will start to do something. Yeah. I, I, I of course chairman of uh, the foundations in universities. I have never asked any donors to donate. It's funny. I just donate my bills first, yeah. and then my friends will follow. Okay. Uh, Patrick, I'd like to take two questions on the floor. They are anonymous, and I think they are quite interesting. Um, they, 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 they want to ask you in your long and successful uh, career. Um, is there any? Uh, is there any decision, big decision, which uh, view uh, which you have, which you have changed your mind on? And the second one is that is there any uh, shortcoming or failure which you have uh, learned from? Yeah, uh, sort of a bit of a reflection, uh, something you change on. And then there's a, another question on your daughter, which I'll ask later. Is about how uh, you didn't allow your wife to work. Well, what what about in this change world? But I think we we'll leave that question for later. But the first two question uh, is about. Uh, uh, things have changed your mind on, uh, and also, uh, is there any shortcoming or failure which you learn from? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I'm a very positive person. I I seldom actually remember uh, my failures, but I know my failures really urge me to uh, to change too. I actually do have a lot of changes too. Uh, of course, as uh, as as you all know, if you are you are um, head of an organization and you change your mind frequently, then you feel that people will not believe you. <laughs> that's the that's the issue. Uh, actually, I, I I I also observe in many of my colleagues too, particularly professional colleagues. Uh, professionals never admit mistakes. That's my always my, my sort of observation. Uh, I know when when um, a professional I mean mistakes, they may think that it is creating a doubt on their professional ability. So when I when I'm in charge of organization where there are different professionals, I'm very careful about uh, their mistakes. I will not advertise their mistakes. I would, I would softly remind them, well, you have done something different and better. But don't worry, we have learned a lesson. The lesson is maybe expensive, but we will have the confidence to learn from it and then get more to uh, sort of even better than what our losses are. That's always my uh, training. But uh, if you personally, there are many, many things uh, uh, that are wrong because when we, for example, introduce some products and we find there is not, no reaction, not much reaction in the market, is a, is a definitely a big mistake. We say it's not a lot of time. We have to learn from that. Uh, but the, the issue is as a leader of the team that does that, you have to give give the team the trust. To, to, to saying that, well, we have done the perfect, the, 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 our best uh, competition, but we never know what happens in the market. Not, we, we probably forget to do enough research in some areas and therefore we can't do that. Or maybe we did devise the, the wrong sales uh, campaign and things like that. So, yeah, definitely there are a lot of wrong mistakes, but I always treat it as a lesson and just go ahead better. 
afterwards. So how about my daughter? Oh, okay. Um, because um, uh, I, 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 I know you were very proud to say that I can quite understand uh, in the 70s, that's about 50 years ago, you said that you didn't want to allow your wife to work. Uh, uh, but but um, we have a question from Catherine Morgan, who is from Gibraltar Actual Society. Yeah. Because in today's context, that is uh, uh, a bit unusual. So, so, so she has a question. If your daughter, if, uh, if your son-in-law did not want your daughter to work, how would you feel about it? And, and, and maybe you could comment it in a larger context of social mores and a changing things, which will lead nicely to some of the bigger questions we can I, discuss. I, I think uh, uh, the culture of different uh, people are different, definitely. And also culture changes from time to time. Now, now in our generation, in our younger generation, everybody have to work. I, I want to see a, a wife asking the husband not to work. <laughs> 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 well, I think, I, think, I think if they can divide their work properly, it's okay. Why, can, why, why can't the man cook? And I think it's equally important. Actually, my wife did a very important work. At home uh, to help us to give us the security when we go home and he and she has 100 percent time to bring up the children so that that she has produced a lot of hard work and she, i appreciate it very much although it's not income not not, not you, you cannot have financial income that but on the other hand you save a lot of other sort of uh, costs also right now we have people who uh, have um, armors, uh, so they can go to work. Yeah, there's, there's, there's one way, but armors create also other problems too. <laughs> there's not just the financial. Uh, I would say that uh, I'm lucky to have my wife who accepts this. <laughs> so I'm very lucky. So, uh, but she really is supporting all my, all my work and so on. And she feels that uh, she, I hope she, she, she didn't feel that she has made a loss <laughs> in her life because of this. But uh, my daughter, uh, she is not married, so uh, she is very free. So um, I, don't, I don't think she has to sort of Right now, has any intention to get married yet? So I don't, I don't know. I don't know. We, we can never influence her. Actually, as a parent, no. Yeah, and I think that that's also you. You mentioned um, at the start of your answer there about kind of uh, cultural differences and and um, you know different expectations. And, and probably uh, a good uh, time kind of to mention that we also now have a very international audience today uh, mm. who would be very curious about your take on uh, global relations, right? So in the context that Hong Kong is uniquely placed between East and West, and, and I'm very curious on your view on how global relations will play out over the coming years uh, yeah. and their implications on the financial sector. Uh, actually, uh, well, in my sort of uh, bringing myself up, I stayed in Hong Kong. Uh, my first trip out of Hong Kong, in fact, in fact, it was to Macau. Yeah. It was after I graduated from Hong Kong U. I never left Hong Kong. So, although we read a lot about international uh, information, or news, and so on, uh, we are not exposed personally outside of Hong Kong. But I think if you travel more and you, particularly if you live overseas more, you, you, you will be better understanding of uh, different cultures. I was very fortunate that uh, the company uh, transferred me to Malaysia. Mm -hmm. So I can, and I stayed there for seven years and I learned so much internationally. And, uh, and Suche, Malaysia is really a great place for actually internship or international relationship. Because uh, really, uh, because they have Malays, Indians, Chinese living peacefully together, and you learn from them. The culture is different. 
although it's all Asian, but all different. Thank you. And 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 and, and it, it it is has also a lot of Western influence too in Malaysia, right? So we, I actually personally learned a lot from 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 different people. I learned that uh, the same the same we do not know. I think it's the same, but they mean they are not wrong. <laughs> They yeah, are right, and this is actually also part of actuarial training. You, you 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 never make a decision based on one fact. You have to look at all all, all angles. So so I think we actually definitely uh, are more culturally sensitive compared to others. Now for international relationship, uh, I always have the opinion that government and government can can fight each other, but people with people should not fight. Mm -hmm. So people, organizations should communicate, and should learn from each other, should help each other. And what the government do is only short term. It's yeah. just to gain votes <laughs> yeah. or to gain power. We don't care. We people should work together. So that's, that's actually something that I learned from uh, one of my peers and employer, Edna. Hengla is a big in, uh, American insurance company during my time. And when I, and I joined them, when I went, for, went to the US for training, one of the lessons is called culture, international culture. They have a professor uh, spending three days with us, uh, the newly appointed senior staff, on international culture. They have learned all the researchers about people, different cultures of, and not just different cultures of nations or races, but how they interact. For example, how Americans react with Australians, how Australians react with Chinese, uh, how Indians react uh, with uh, Canadians, and things like that is a, is a very great sort of uh, opening of minds. So I think international relationship, I always think that government relations is one thing, people should understand each other. Patrick, uh, we have only uh, eight minutes left and we've got quite a few things to do in the last eight minutes. Uh, one, okay. one is that Nikki, uh, Nikki uh, there are two more questions on culture. Um, okay. Before you do that, Nikki, can you uh, put up your QR code so that members of the audience, we value your feedback. You can do the feedback very quickly on your iPhone or your Android. Uh, but there are two questions on culture. Eh? By the way, uh, 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 Patrick, uh, my, my good friend uh, Katina is is also Malaysian born. Yeah, it's also Malaysian born. Oh. Um, <laughs> you may not know this. Yeah, but, but she's Malaysian born. Thompson was never Malaysian. But uh, Patrick, my, the, the two questions are, are quite interesting. Uh, there's a question from an anonymous person. He was very curious on your calligraphy, your, your Chinese calligraphy on the back. Uh, what does it mean? And uh, is, it, uh, is it from your name, he asked, and how do you energize the next generation? There's the first question. Yes. And, and the second question probably is quite interesting because you got a large audience on Southeast Asia uh, and, 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 and you, will be, you will mean a lot to them. What is your favorite Malaysian food? Yeah. So, so, so maybe you can do the first question first about uh, the calligraphy and then, uh, and, then, uh, uh, and then the Malaysian food, yeah? I think Malaysian food is shorter because it's very easy. Pakut uh, day and chow uh, kway Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, for the calligraphy, it was, the, it was given to me by uh, Hang Seng University. Uh, it's a private university in Hong Kong. I'm, I'm in the board and also I'm the uh, chairman of the fundraising and the chairman of the uh, foundation of the university. And they gave me this uh, calligraphy uh, to thank me for my donation uh, to name a, uh, a college, uh, college for, for the undergraduates. So it, it is actually part of my name. Uh, the four letters means that um, fire or torch get passed from generation to generations. That means my fire is passing to other generations. That's the meaning of that, uh, that poster behind me, that side, okay? Uh, because my name, 
is a lot of fire. Actually, the first character is my name. Actually, Sun. Sun is my name. Uh, is uh, the Chinese character for fire. Actually, not small fire, big fire. Uh, the reason my grandfather gave uh, me this name is that according to Chinese uh, birthdays, uh, birth times, and so on, I lack fire in my body. So I should have in my name more fire. So that's why the word sun was there. I, I think, uh, Patrick, that is a, what a wonderful story to end. Eh? Uh, uh, because by your sponsorship uh, of the philanthropy uh, of the foundation and uh, thought leadership, you, you are actually passing the fire down to the next generation of uh, actually recently in the Southeast Asia and the China region, and of course the thought leadership. Uh, and, I, I, and I would like to make sure that you come back uh, to, to an Asian conference uh, in the first quarter of next year. We are, we are busy planning it, but today is a special edition. Uh, so I'm going to bring the, the, the session to a close. You, you have any uh, final remarks well, you would like to make? Uh, I want to personally thank uh, you and the Institute FIF, IFOA for giving me this opportunity to help and also today uh, to share some of my thoughts too. I always count myself very lucky that I always given opportunities to do something that I like. Thank you very much. And I want to thank on behalf of, of the IFOA and a lot of students uh, and members uh, for your generosity and also for your vision uh, for the profession and, and your heartfelt feelings you have for the IFOA, which you have spoken to me uh, in private. Yeah, So I appreciate that very much. Um, and I, would like to, I want you to come back to Southeast Asia in Hong Kong to speak to, to the members, uh, but that will have to wait uh, to next year when COVID-19 uh, is more settled. But with that, I'd like to... Uh, 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 Nikki, you may want to... Uh, take off the QR code so that I could sort of formally close. Yeah. Uh, so so um, it, it's time to close the session and and uh, and also to thank uh, uh, Katina. And I've lost uh, my script, but I would look into the the slide. I lost my script, but it, it doesn't matter. Uh, if you uh, Katina, is there a last slide? Uh, to, today is uh, the closing session. Uh, Katina, if you could share the last slide. Um, I think Nikki, you... No, 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 Katina. Nikki, could you share the last slide? Sorry, uh, uh, Nikki. Uh, that's why the last slide is on the remaining of the events. I, I just want to, uh, to thank the members for attending. Uh, for memory, there are still four events left. Uh, we, we have uh, one on uh, adapting to uncertainty, which is about to start in half an hour's time. And then there is an event on uh, cultural transformation of profession. That is the ultimate event with all the past president. There was uh, there's also an event on um, uh, systems thinking um, and and the tragedy of consciousness, uh, which is uh, anchored by Hodgson. Um, uh, Nikki, are you able to share the slide, or, or the slide is not present? Um, uh, but in any case, uh, we are coming to a close yeah uh, just give me a moment uh. I, I I just want to uh, I, I didn't have a slide uh, uh, there's no final slide uh, but that's one, uh, that's fine that, that's the final slide for next session uh, which is managing uncertainty but I just wanted to tell the audience that, that there are about four or five sessions left uh, and it will be of great interest uh, uh, and we are getting uh, uh, turn up which is very good. So with that, I, I think I would like to uh, thank my uh, co-host, uh, Katina, who, uh, and I really enjoy sharing the session with, with her. Uh, and also, Patrick, uh, thanks for your, your time. I, I know you're busy and, of course, your support. Uh, so, so with that, um, I bid farewell to, uh, to all the members uh, who tune in, uh, and, and, and I hope to see you in about half an hour's time for the Managing or Adapting to Uncertainty uh, webinar. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye.